Hi, this is Mrs. Horseman, and we are looking at the beginning of our discussion on theory of evolution. This is standard nine, and if you're following along in your book, we're looking at chapter 13. Um, here's your objectives. In order to be proficient, in order to score a level three, you need to explain how natural selection affects a specific population, and then if I give you a specific example of evidence of evolution, you need to describe how that actually supports the theory. A little bit of background about Charles Darwin. He is actually the person who coined the term natural selection or um, evolution. He wrote a book called Origin of the Species. Um, he was born in 1809 and um, he was famous because he traveled the world on a ship called the USS Beagle. And as his, his role on the ship was to collect evidence, collect specimens, um, fossils, draw out organisms that he may have seen um, as he, they traveled around the world. And they traveled to many different continents and many different pieces of land. And he started actually seeing these patterns or these similarities that existed between organisms that lived in these totally different bodies of land. And because he had such an interest in the natural world, he started making connections. So, um, like I said, he collected lots of evidence and um, then he came back to England, which was where he is from, and he sat down and he wrote this amazing book. And he actually kind of held on to it for a while. And he walked around and gave speeches and went to different universities and talked to students. And um, he wasn't very well liked back in those days because back when Darwin was living, most of the people understood that everything that happened was because of God's will. So changes that happened in their environment were because God willed it. So Darwin came along saying, that's not true. These changes have occurred because of changes in the environment and those that are better suited to their environment are the ones that survived. So I'm sure you can understand that people didn't like his point of view very well. But now in the 21st century, we are accepting that as, as factual knowledge and there we have tons of evidence that supports that. And we will talk about that evidence as we go along in this discussion. Um, a little bit of information that you need to know before we can actually start talking about natural selection. Um, we'll talk about species and populations more as we talk about ecology. But in order for you to understand what natural selection is, you actually have to understand what those terms mean. So a species is a group of organisms that are closely related and naturally mate to produce fertile offspring. Fertile offspring is talking about their offspring can then reproduce and, and produce more offspring as well. So examples of non-fertile offspring would be um, things that you might be familiar with. A mule, which is a cross between a donkey and a horse, or a liger, which is a cross between a tiger and a lion, and I'm sure that right now you are thinking about Napoleon Dynamite because that's the first thing I think of when I hear the word liger. Um, those organisms cannot produce offspring themselves because they are non-fertile. So they technically are not a species. Um, we're, when we talk about species, you also need to understand the term population. A population is a group of organisms that are within the same species that live in a specific area and breed within that species in that specific area. So they may be separated geologically. Um, and an example is um, like if you have a mountain range that has grown over time and there may be a species of squirrels on one side and a species of squirrels on the other side, but because they are on different sides of that mountain range, the likelihood that they will come together to mate are, is pretty low. So most likely they will not interbreed with each other. So they would be considered different populations even though they're the same species of the, kind, of the same kind of organism. Okay, other information that you need to understand. 
we are talking, when we talk about natural selection and evolution, we are talking about populations that evolve over generations of time. We're not talking about an individual organism, okay? And we're not talking about thing, things that they do within their lifetime that change and match the environment, so therefore they have evolved. That is not what we're talking about at all, so please get that out of your mind. Um, we are looking right here at this picture. We're looking at a view of the geological time scale. And if you see, um, whoops, sorry. If you see way down here, this is where scientists believe is the beginning of the earth. We, um, scientists have done um, radioactive dating. So within this process, they have determined the age of the earth. So, they have figured out because of the way that the atoms are and because of how atoms break down over long periods of time, they have determined that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. That is pretty darn old, All right? So as we go along, the oldest rock on Earth is dated at about 4 point something billion years old. And again, we've scientists have figured that out because of um, radioactive dating. If you come along a little bit further, about three billion years ago, we have found the oldest fossil of single cellular organisms. Those are prokaryotes. And if you recall from way back at the beginning of biology, we talked about prokaryotes being single celled organisms that do not have a nucleus. They're very simple organisms, okay? So that was about three billion years ago. Um, time has traveled and about a little over two billion years ago, um, which is hard to think about, but that long ago, um, we started seeing um, fossils that are multicellular organisms that actually have a nucleus. So this was the beginning of eukaryotic organisms. And time has changed, the geological landscape of the Earth has changed, um, we have seen the Earth change from one large continent to multiple continents over time. It has gone from a, an environment that didn't have a, very much water to an environment that has um, almost 80% water. And we have seen over time these organisms growing from single cellular organisms to multicellular organisms to more evolved complex organisms. Okay, and right here you start so noticing there's not much green or any green in this part of the time scale. About 409 million years ago is when the first plants showed up on Earth. And after that happened, organisms started moving on to land. So we saw the evolution from um, fish to reptiles. And this is where the famous Jurassic period occurred. So if you've ever heard of Jurassic Park, that's where that came from. This is where the time of period that dinosaurs lived on the earth. And then we move, um, there was a massive change. And then about 23 million years ago, we started seeing um, mammals become larger. And mammals actually started kind of taking over the earth at that point in time. Here we have a, um, a woolly mammoth. And then right about here, 0 0.01 million years ago is where the first ancestor of humans actually appeared on the time scale. So kind of to put things into perspective. So how exactly does evolution work? Evolution is driven by the mechanism that we call natural selection, and Darwin actually coined that term. Have you ever heard of the phrase survival of the fittest? Okay, well that is natural selection. Natural selection is the process where members of a population that have favorable variations that have been inherited through the passing down of traits from previous generations are better suited to their environment. Therefore, they are able to survive and they are able to reproduce and then they can pass on their traits to their offspring. So what that means is those individuals that don't inherit the favorable traits that don't help them survive are very much less likely to pass their traits on to their offspring. So what we see here um, 
this is a kind of a cartoon picture, but I think it really drives home the point of what I'm trying to tell you. We have some pictures of crows here, and they're saying, yum, green beetles, our favorite. So in this instance, the orange beetles are the ones that have the inherited characteristic, the color trait that makes them non-desirable to the crows. So they're not going to be eaten. So what you're going to actually see is this population over time is going to change from a population of largely green beetles to a population that is a higher amount of orange beetles because for whatever reason those crows don't like the orange beetles very much. So how exactly does evolution work? In order to understand natural selection, you have to consider these features of it. Okay, so we're going to talk about time and genetic variation and overproduction, struggle for existence, which is talking about competition, and then we're going to talk about survival and reproduction. So we have established that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. That is really old. And in that amount of time, the environments have changed. So what I'm talking about is geological landscapes and climates and biological resources. Did you know Colorado, which if you consider the, the geography of the United States, it's kind of in the middle of the United States. It's a little bit closer to the west side, but it's pretty much in the middle. Colorado used to actually be part of it in the ocean and part of it by the ocean, so part of it was actually the seascape. Um, now, definitely not the case. Now it is above sea level because of the mountain range that has cropped up. So when I'm talking about geological landscapes changing, that's what I'm talking about. The, the earth has definitely shifted and there are definitely parts of the earth that are now exposed to air where previously they may have been exposed to underwater and vice versa. So because of that, organisms have had to either adapt to their environment or become extinct. So depending on those changes, species have either become extinct or have become able to survive without change or have become a, um, a new species has derived from the populations that have changed over time. So when we talk about evolution, we're talking about changes over time through generations, maybe hundreds or thousands of years. Another thing that we need to consider is genetic variation. When we talked about heredity, we learned that species inherit traits from previous generations, and those traits show up in their phenotype or their physical characteristics. Those traits are varied because of sexual reproduction, and we talked about genetic variation being actually an advantage of sexual reproduction. So because of that, these populations are very genetically diverse. You see here in the pictures that I have available for you, we see some grizzly bears, and they look very different even though they are the same population. Those grizzly bears live in the same area. They can interbreed with each other, but they look very different from each other in size and in coloration. I also show you some different snail shells, same population of snails, but they have different coloration and different patterns on their shelves um, within that population. And the same thing for the flowers. You see three different flowers that are all of the same species, but they look a little bit different because of their coloration. So genetic variation is one of the features of natural selection. Another thing that we have to consider is overproduction of offspring. Organisms produce more offspring than the environment can support. And when I'm talking about um, natural selection and changes over time, get humans out of your mind because humans have evolved to a point where we can provide for ourselves, we have protection for ourselves, um, and we have limited offspring because of these things. So what I'm talking about overproduction of offspring, for the most part, I'm talking about organisms that live in the wild. Um, so I have a picture here of turtle, these are sea turtles, and in every 1,000 eggs that are laid, about only one of those are actually going to reach adulthood and be able to reproduce themselves, okay? So we talk about overproduction of offspring. This is most organisms in the wild 
produce more offspring than will likely survive in that environment. And that is because organisms need to ensure that at least some of the offspring are going to reach adulthood so they can reproduce and pass on their genes to the following generation. Um, when we talk about natural selection, we're also talking about struggle for existence. Organisms and populations have to be fit to their environment. And when I talk about fit, I don't mean like physically fit, like muscles and can run a 5K or, or a marathon. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say fitness, I'm actually referring to individuals that have an advantage to their environment, which allows them to survive and reproduce. Most organisms, their key part of survival is reproduction. Okay, that is their main goal. So here are some ways that organisms can be fit to their environment. They can be camouflaged. So if you see this um, aphid right here, it is green and it very closely resembles the leaf that it's sitting on. So a bird that's flying over that leaf is not probably going to be able to see the aphid. So that aphid is probably safe. It's probably most likely, whoop, it is most likely not going to be eaten by a bird. Um, so camouflage is one of the ways that organisms maintain fitness. Bright colors, so if you look down here, we have this poison dart frog. That poison dart frog tells its predators, I'm poisonous, you don't want to eat me. Okay, that's an advantage to that frog. There are actually organisms that have um, evolved into uh, mimicking those bright colors so that predators avoid them as well, even though they may not be poisonous. Um, we have um, organisms that are faster or taller or stronger or smaller. It depends on their environment, but whatever features, whatever physical traits allow them to be better suited to their environment and allows them to survive to pass on those physical traits are going to be considered fit. Okay, so basically what we're talking about is does that organism possess qualities that allow it to successfully survive? If it does, then we would call it fit to its environment. Just a couple more things. When we talk about differential survival and reproduction, in any given environment, organisms struggle to survive in order to do what they instinctively need to do, which is reproduce. So by inheriting those favorable traits in order to survive, that has allowed those populations to become adapted to the environment. And when I say adapted, those organisms themselves are not changing. They're not, um, for instance, giraffes. Giraffes didn't stretch their necks out within their lifetime to make sure that they could reach the leaves that were available. Those that had longer necks because of their genes that they inherited were able to reach the food that was available. So then they were able to um, reproduce and pass on those genes for long necks. Okay, so the so what I'm talking about adaptations, I'm talking about inherited traits that are favorable to that organism to survival in that environment. It's an anatomical trait or a physiological trait or a behavioral trait that allows them to be better suited to their environments. And I'm showing these pictures because these are some finches that Darwin actually um, established. So these finches, even though they're all have um, common ancestors, they have very different shapes to their beaks. Okay, and these were actually found in different parts of the Galapagos Islands. Some of the finches that survived were better suited to more dry environments where they had more seeds and nuts available. And that would be like this guy number one. Um, right here that has a thicker beak that's better for crunching down on nuts, where this one is maybe better suited to a more succulent environment that has more lush um, greenery that maybe needs to get at the nectar that is in those plants or maybe get at the bugs that are hiding within those plants. So when I talk about adaptations, I talk about genetic inheritance that gives those features an advantage to living in that environment.